Hello, welcome to today's Asian Impact webinar from the Asian Development Bank. In today's interactive session, we want to hear from you as we talk with a number of experts on the critical role of research in generating innovative solutions to the problems of today and the problems of tomorrow. What should we be focusing on? How should we be doing it? To set the stage for the discussion, we have the Asian Development Bank Vice President for Knowledge Management and Sustainable Development, Mr. Bambang Susantono. Bambang. Thank you, Karen. Distinguished panelists, colleagues from ADB and ADBI universities, ladies and gentlemen, a very good day in January 2022 and a warm welcome to everyone. And thank you for joining this opening sessions of ADB's Fourth Economist Forum. I am looking forward to hearing from our distinguished panelists their insights on how ADB and ADBI economic research can help drive innovative solutions to our region's development challenges. I also want to use this opportunity to introduce to you our new chief economist, Dr. Albert Park, who brings a wealth of knowledge and experiences from a very distinguished career in academia, as well as strong visions on aligning ADB research agenda to the rapidly evolving needs of the regions. We are also very honored today to be joined by Dean Sonobe of ADBI. The knowledge partnership between ADB and ADBI has always been unlike any other in its depth and impact. Today is another important opportunity to discuss how to leverage our collaborations for driving academically rigorous economic research. And last but absolutely not the least, we have our Pacific Regional Department's Director General, Lea Gutierrez. No discussion on knowledge will be complete without the views from the ADB operations on how to better connect our research to solutions. I look forward to hearing from Lea on how ADB and ADBI can deliver research that is, that is not only high in quality, but also relevant to current and emerging policies in our developing members. Dear colleagues, we are at the critical stage of our region's economic growth and development. We all know the disruptions the pandemic brought to lives and livelihoods across Asia and the Pacific. In many cases, the pandemic has slowed and in some cases even reversed progress toward achieving the sustainable development goals, which has already been widely off track even before the pandemic. As we shift the focus toward recovery, building back better is just not enough unless we find ways to turn the pandemic into an opportunity to build forward better our region will not be meeting our international commitment we must move toward a more sustainable resilient and inclusive economic future this includes for example green investment like clean energy and more social investment in public health and education among others the pandemic has actually offered an opportunity to accelerate our planning and to do more to achieve these goals. Against this background, more and more people are looking to economies for research and evidence-based policy analysis to create more innovative solutions to our region's development challenges. ADB has focused on knowledge management since its establishment in 1966. While ADB was founded as a bank to provide development funding, we are also a valued knowledge advisor to our member countries. Over half a century, we have amassed a wealth of knowledge, both to share and stimulate more research. In the 1980s, we supported projects on a case-by-case -case basis to help shape policy reforms. In the 1990s, it expanded country-focused agendas from projects to sectors. It was also during this time that we reach out to more regional approaches and globalizations, development supply chains, if you will. Our operations were increasingly supported by knowledge, knowledge that made our lending far more effective. Then our strategy 2030 truly placed knowledge center stage, with ADB playing a much larger role in harnessing knowledge for development across Asia and the Pacific. It became clear that as many developing members reach middle income status, our relevance will increasingly depend on our ability to provide quality knowledge. So as we continue to move into pandemic recovery, we must use more and more our convening power to encourage collaborations among different knowledge stakeholders. 
We must provide platform for sharing ideas, knowledge, and experience across the region and among sub-regions. And in doing this together, we will also move the wider development discourse forward. Original research drives our reputation as knowledge institution. It is our competitive advantage. High quality, timely, and relevant research plays a key role in sound policy making, maintaining high standards in project design and implementations. It helps identify good practices. It also allows us to spread this knowledge, knowledge skills, and expertise together with our developing member. So how does our economic research agenda remain policy relevant, cutting edge, and agile enough to tackle both longstanding and emerging development challenges? I see three ways we can do this. First is quality. We must ensure our economies continue to boost the quality of our research in response to our clients' needs. This is even more important now as economies face tremendous challenges, whether existing, evolving, or new. Our clients are increasingly looking for informed, accurate, reliable, and competent advice. It is our responsibility to stay ahead, learn new techniques, and provide rigorous insights to maintain and bolster our credibility with clients. We must always support our ADP colleagues in their work, particularly in operations. We should also work effectively with our global partner and other multilateral institutions to collaborate on research that matters. And most importantly, we must continue to grow as a knowledge leader for development. The pandemic has accelerated change in research across many cross-cutting areas and themes. For example, the need to create cities that are green, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable, in short, more livable, is much more clear. This will require sharing knowledge solutions that involve innovations, promoting new technology and digitalizations, and applying good practices in urban governance. Similarly, to ensure that new energy is clean, innovative solutions are required in mobilizing private finance, public property partnership, and managing investment risks. Second is the intellectual bonding across ADB, ADBI, and our friends in other institutions. There are over 150 economies integral to our knowledge network, sharing our work and knowledge to raise our profile as the region's knowledge bank. For instance, our annual economies forum is a venue for raising the profile of our research and providing an opportunity for working economies to shape ADB research agenda. But equally important, it is also an opportunity to share knowledge across ADB, ADB and our research network. I'm happy to see that since our first economist forum in 2019, this knowledge hub has deepened in both strength and quality. Third is getting the word out. I strongly encourage each and every one of you to make your tacit knowledge explicit. It helps to think about packaging, publishing, and disseminations in cooperation with the Department of Communications. There are many ways to reach your audience, from academic journal, policy journals, internal briefs and reports, blogs, and also opinion pieces. And now we have our increasingly popular webinar, podcasts, and other digital outlets. Our Asian Development Review and Policy Design and Practice Journal are also valuable outlets. I personally invite you to write in these journals. So, dear colleagues, as you can see from my presentations, we already have an excellent record of contributing to knowledge products on a wide range of development issues across the region. However, we must continue to ramp up our work to deliver top quality and timely research on crucial economic topics. I look forward to hearing from our panel and others on how best we can do this. We should be always better in strengthening our position as the knowledge solution partner in the regions. I do hope that this event will set the stage for all of us to have a better knowledge year of 2022. Thank you, and once again, a warm welcome to all. Back to you, Karen. 
Thank you very much, VP. Yeah, I think you, you raised a number of very important questions about the, the big uh, issues that we have to be uh, looking at, but also the interconnected nature, both of, uh, of the problems and potentially the solutions as well. Um, this is an interactive session, so we would really like to see questions coming in. Please pop them in the Q&A box. Uh, as you probably saw from the opening slides, please do like any questions that you see, the pop, most popular ones will pop to the top. We'll address those. And of course, we'll address as many as we can in the hour that we have here. So I see we have one question in already. But just before we get to that and to allow other people a little bit of time to think and pop their questions there, I would like to ask a couple of questions of the panelists that we have gathered here today. And Albert, I'd like to start with you, um, if I may, to ask possibly the broadest question. The broadest question, what do you see as the key issues that should be driving research in the, com in the coming years from a development or indeed a development bank perspective? Right. Thank you, Karen. Uh, and I'd like to welcome everyone to this year's uh, Economist Forum. I'm personally really looking forward to learning more about all of the exciting research occurring uh, at the ADB. Um, since I began uh, my uh, uh, post as chief economist, um, I've really been energized to learn about a lot of the exciting research that is ongoing, and in particular, the really incredible efforts that have been made to obtain new types of data to produce innovative research. I thought it would be a good idea as a new chief economist to engage in a dialogue about what the research priorities for the department should be going forward. And um, I'd like to report on kind of an interim result of that discussion. And I'm gonna share my screen and present a, just one slide. It's a kind of a busy slide, so we'll take a second to absorb. Um, but these are uh, research priorities that, uh, that we've identified. And um, to be a research priority, the first thing that I've kept in mind is what has policy relevance? and importance, especially for the work of the ADB. Um, second, where are the knowledge gaps? What types of issues and topics? And of course, new challenges often create knowledge gaps because there, there isn't a lot of experience. And I think COVID is <laughs> a clear example of that. And finally, where are there data opportunities where we can fill these knowledge gaps uh, in a way that uh, takes advantage of new opportunities, especially uh, given the availability of new types of big data and digital um, data resources. So um, in this slide, I present six kind of research priority areas. This is not an exhaustive list. Um, it's really just an indicative list of areas that I think are quite prominent. The first is poverty and inequality. Uh, of course, as a, a multilateral development bank, poverty reduction is the core of the mission of the ADB. And there's a lot of interesting work that we are working on in terms of extending poverty measurement, both in terms of mapping poverty, using more innovative indicators of economic activity, but also thinking more about multidimensional poverty. There's been a lot of work in the US by Raj Chetty and others about how neighborhood factors you know, really affect economics of opportunity. The second area is economic integration. And this is a broad term. It includes our work on global value chains which is obviously given trade tensions and trade disruptions and new trade agreements is a key issue to think about how those changes are going to affect uh, developing countries. And there's also um, new data opportunities, trying to connect input output tables to micro data. Also thinking about economic integration in terms of the role of infrastructure. And again, thinking about big data opportunities to have a more precise picture of the different types of economic impacts and the distributional effects about who benefits and loses from different types of infrastructure projects. And of course, uh, trade agreements, we have the new RCEP uh, agreement in Asia, which will be quite important in the region. The third area is skills and the future of work. And uh, one, this is an area of research that I've personally been active in recently, trying to understand how the nature of jobs is, is changing by collecting data on job tasks. And uh, also, of course, if we think about the pandemic, one of the huge issues is the scarring effects on the labor market and a learning loss that's affecting uh, human capital in the region. And there's enormous work to try to think about minimizing those losses and scarring effects, but also later how to cope with them. 
through thinking carefully about uh, evaluating education and health interventions. Um, so the next area here, just working around the circle is climate change and sustainable development. Of course, this is a huge area of new commitment uh, by the ADB, but more globally, of course, it's one of the key challenges facing uh, all countries around the world, especially developing countries. And so some areas of importance, I think, green finance, firm, um, ESG performance, uh, thinking about the microeconomics of uh, energy production and urban transport. And finally, um, uh, sorry, two more categories, macro and financial stability. This reflects the ongoing work of our macroeconomics research group. Again, there's new types of uh, big data from SWIFT, uh, from thinking about new economic indicators of uh, ac economic activity like uh, night lights, et cetera. And then finally, the digital economy, which really affects all of the other boxes. And in fact, there are many interaction effects among these uh, research priority areas. And there's, of course, opportunities now to collect online data to understand a lot of different economic questions and behaviors um, with big amounts of data, uh, but also thinking more carefully about how to measure digital infrastructure, digital trade in both goods and services. Uh, these are all um, new areas of research that are really shaping uh, the future of uh, economic development in the region. So let me stop there and... Uh, and I, by the way, I really would like feedback on these priorities. It's an ongoing kind of evolving document. Thank you. Thanks very much, Albert, thanks. Um, you have just come here, but uh, you said, you know, a lot of work to be done by you and the rest of the team. And you said you wanted feedback, just to mention it's in the, uh, in the box, but um, if you want to follow Albert as our new chief economist, you can do that on Twitter at at ADB Chief Econ. So uh, that's the place to give him feedback and that's the place where he'll be uh, also uh, putting a lot of our ADB research um, and, and his commentary as well. Um, Tetsushi, I wanted to come to you next if I may. Obviously you're with uh, the Asian Development Bank Institute, the Tokyo-based think tank, very well regarded think tank, if I may say so. Um, but I wanted to ask you about collaboration. It's something that the VP mentioned in his opening remarks. How important do you think collaboration is um, in terms of uh, you know, generating innovative research, perhaps building on relative strengths? And I do see that that is a, a question in the chat box as well from a number of people. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, ADBI uh, has been benefiting enormously from its name, the ADB Institute. Because of the name includes ADB, people trust ADBI, and the people expect ADBI's knowledge products and services, such as e-learning programs, books, and webinars to be useful. So ADBI has hold uh, held maybe 70 webinars or more uh, per year for the last two years. And in my impression, about a quarter or a third of ADBI webinars were co-hosted by ADB, and the rest are supported a lot by speakers from ADB. And the ERCD and the ADBI are working on joint publication projects and the joint database project. Uh, by collaborating with ADB colleagues, ADBI can provide our clients with high quality knowledge products and services far beyond the region standard. So the advantage of ADBI over other think tanks in the region and beyond can be clearly attributed to being a subsidiary of ADB. Now, turning to the comparative advantage of ADBI vis-a-vis -vis ADB, I would say that uh, it has not been clearly articulated, except for some of my statements at ADB board meetings and across the board meetings and within ADBI for the last two years. I'm afraid that before I joined ADBI in April 2020, the comparative advantage was not explored seriously. And the mutual benefits of the division of labor in the right direction were realized only a little. Just because you did not see the benefits before, so Karen, 
you ask me if collaboration is beneficial. And because I believe the benefits of collaboration must be enormously large, I have been trying to realize them by making a comparative advantage very clear for the last two years. The source of comparative advantage in this case is the difference in the institutional setting or arrangement. ADBI staff members are all employed for three to five years. We can change the composition of our expertise relatively quickly. And the organization is very small and flat. So moreover, ADBI is not working under technical assistance. So the decision making and the approval process here are very short compared with ADB headquarters. Our comparative advantage lies in nimbleness, flexibility, and also readiness to work with networks, with universities, think tanks, and NGOs, as, as well as the government. Uh, the importance of creating and applying knowledge at uh, ADB or in ADB uh, has been growing very fast, as BPKM emphasized. So ADB should take advantage of having such a convenient subsidiary, namely ADBI. Well, my talk is becoming lengthy. Although I have not described what the mutual benefits will be, I stop here because the audience today wants to listen to and interact with our new chief economist, Albert. So back to you, Karen. <laughs> Thanks very much, Ted Sushi. Thank you. And I hope that answers your question, uh, Milan. Um, over to you, Leah. Uh, you've worked at ADB for a number of years uh, in a number of different regions. You're currently uh, the Director General of the Pacific Department, of course. But um, so looking at it from more a government perspective, what sort of knowledge, innov innovation, research needs do you see as, as critical for, for developing uh, country? perhaps particularly in, in the Pacific, which is very unique, perhaps. I'll also come back to you later, if I may, also on this first question from Jeanette, but perhaps that one first. Okay, great. Uh, well, thank you, Karen, uh, for your question, and uh, good day, colleagues and participants. Um, before I proceed, I would like uh, to thank our economics department for inviting me to join today's uh, panel of econ economist colleagues whom I respect highly. Uh, going to your question, uh, Karen, um, as Vipi Susantona has said in his introduction, research plays a very uh, important role, if not a key role, in our work uh, with our developing member countries. Um, it, it informs uh, the timely, high-quality advice we provide. It helps us design knowledge solutions and appropriate projects and programs. And it helps us contribute uh, to advancing the thinking on many development issues. It is important that we partner with other institutions in undertaking research as we learn from each other's experiences and knowledge. Uh, first, uh, I hope you don't mind. I would like to first share uh, some of the knowledge work that our colleagues have uh, been undertaking in our operations work. And some of this are in partnership, in fact, with colleagues in our economics department and also ADBI and also our sector colleagues. Um, and then later I will share the areas uh, where we would like to learn more from a research uh, perspective. Um, so just uh, some examples, uh, and I do hope that uh, everyone uh, in this uh, seminar uh, would also uh, look up uh, these studies on our, webs uh, on our websites. Um, so colleagues in Southeast Asia have actually undertaken studies related to green finance, particularly uh, as it relates uh, to the post-COVID-19 uh, uh, recovery. Um, they've, they've also done quite a bit of work in terms of the impact of COVID uh, from a macro, on, uh, the macro, on the macro economies, um, also on domestic resource mobilization, and also on how uh, digitization and big data could be employed. Colleagues in Central and uh, West Asia have been uh, paying attention to what's going on in terms of skills, uh, particular, particularly technical and vocational education and training, uh, for, uh, for including the policy options. Uh, they've also been looking at the role of ports and logistics. And as we know, this is actually a key issue uh, in today's uh, pandemic world. 
And uh, FinTech has also been uh, looked at vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, trade financing needs and also supporting our underserved uh, micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, and if I may plug, in the Pacific, uh, we've also done some work on climate change and disaster risk management. Uh, together with the government of Tonga, we actually undertook a comprehensive multi-hazard disaster risk assessment, uh, focusing on the island of Tonga Tapu and its cap and the capital Nukualofa. Um, this uh, combined a climate lens uh, with expected frequency and impact of other natural hazards, including seismic events. And I would like to share that uh, following the explosive eruption, eruption that uh, we saw, uh, that many of us saw in the news of the Honga Tonga, Honga Hapai volcano last weekend, uh, the databases that we've generated and our assessments have been shared uh, with volcano science experts uh, for preliminary damage assessments. Uh, uh, for us, uh, climate change is also very, uh, the impact of climate change is also very important in the Pacific. And to inform uh, one of our uh, projects on clean water, uh, estimating the greenhouse gas emissions, we actually undertook a household survey on water boiling practices. And we actually use this in our economic analysis. Uh, we've also done some work. Uh, so we've done uh, some policy brief on central bank digital currencies on uh, how it can promote accessible access to financial services in Pacific Island countries. In East Asia, work has also been undertaken on cir circular economies for green recovery, uh, innovations in sanitation, and integrated water resources management. Uh, looking forward, uh, the immediate development challenges our DMCs face are of course related to, co to COVID and there's a range of them. The issues span a wide range as our DMCs include small island developing states, fragile and conflict affected situations, as well as middle income economies. Um, for the topics, I actually asked uh, colleagues across the regions and I asked them on how can research inform or work towards a green, resilient and inclusive recovery. So of course, related to the pandemic, uh, some of the questions uh, that came up are, relate, are related to the stimulus programs. Uh, the question is the timing and the pace of fiscal consolidation. Also looking at the impact of the pandemic on the value chain and trade uh, production and prices. Uh, as we know, inflation is expected to go up. Uh, next, uh, we would like to take a look at the impact on poverty, income inequality, gender, achieving the SDGs, climate change actions, and also sector impacts. Um, and many of the many of the many of this, uh, Albert, Albert has actually included uh, in his uh, earlier slide. Uh, in the medium term, um, I would like to mention a few of what colleagues have also mentioned uh, that would be good to look into. And these are urbanization and growth. Um, as we know, we all know the role of our urban sectors uh, and as a, as a strong growth engine of national economic development. But we need to take a look at how to transition from current systems of management to desired approaches. Also, uh, infra uh, regulation of infrastructure and cost recovery. We all would like to support high quality infrastructure. Uh, however, at the same time, cost recovery remains an issue. So this is something that we also would like to, uh, to take a look at, uh, particularly approaches to providing uh, subsidies uh, without creating distortions uh, for infrastructure providers or the environment. Um, Albert has mentioned uh, skills and uh, high education. Uh, this is also an area we would be interested in, uh, particularly the linkages uh, with industry and also the SMEs. And, of, uh, and speaking of SMEs, how can we actually encourage their dynamism and their further integration into the global value chain? Um, as we know, uh, there's a large share of employment that's, that are actually in our MSMEs. 
And then um, uh, for SIDS, uh, for small island developing uh, states, I would like to highlight uh, tourism. Uh, we would like uh, to we would like to undertake more studies related to more sustainable, inclusive, and resilient tourism sector. It has generated quite uh, it has generated many jobs, and this is actually uh, one asset that many uh, small island economies do have. Uh, next. Uh, migration, labor migration. This has been well studied in many of our middle income and other economies. However, in the context of small island developing states, this needs uh, further investigation. And of course, uh, the fragility and resilience uh, frameworks. Uh, we need to have uh, better assessments. And uh, in part, we actually ourselves are starting this uh, particular kind of study. Um, I also would like to men mention uh, sustainable finance and also domestic resource mobilization in the Pacific. And um, I know I'm, uh, I'm, I've talked too much. Uh, last but not the least, I would like to uh, mention to our economics uh, colleagues, uh, maybe let's start thinking about uh, a new generation of project econom economic an analysis approaches. Um, I think uh, traditional project analysis have uh, certain weaknesses, so it may be something interesting to work on to, into. So, um, so I will stop here. Uh, sorry for the lengthy uh, intervention. Thank you, no, Karen. No problem, Leah. Uh, I think as you as you said, there is a lot of work to be done. It's very interconnected and so forth. Um, could I uh, can I just stay with you for a moment? We have this question from uh, Jeanette. Uh, posted first, so I think we should be sure to answer it. She's very keen. Um, uh, how do we how do we uh, close that gap between uh, the knowledge work of our economists and the uh, the implementation on the ground? Any thoughts around that? Perhaps okay. briefly from you, and then I'll ask Albert um, as well. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh for us, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the research actually informs the policy advice and the, pro and the programs that we do design. So what this means is that we need to have uh, a close, we need to have uh, research that's actually relevant, that's responsive to the issues uh, that uh, our developing member countries are facing. So we really need to be a working uh, working with them, understanding the issues and policies. We have to be responsive to those issues and challenges. And then we have to work together. Uh, I see research, uh, pol policy research work as really interactive. It's not just us, but it's actually all of us working together. With all of us working together and um, the research being highly relevant, then uh, the take up and implementation of these policies would be higher. I'll stop here. Thank you. Mm, great, thanks. Uh, Albert, anything to add? Yes, well, under the you know, Knowledge Action Plan Initiative, uh, our department has uh, proposed a number of different measures to try to have better communication with operations and to provide better support. I, we're very open to thinking about ways uh, to do a better job. Uh, I think broadly speaking, one thing I would emphasize is that the more that uh, economists um, in ERCD can be involved upstream at the strategy level, first designing the kind of country uh, policies, the strategies um, that can feed into the broader um, advice but then even um, when it comes to the design of major projects to be involved earlier and in really almost at the conceptual level about whether this is uh, a good idea, a bad idea, I think the insights of um, our research economists can be really meaningful there and have a big, uh, bigger impact. And so we're very keen to do that. Um, and we're, uh, we're trying to open up new lines of communication with uh, economists working in the country missions so that uh, there's a better awareness of what they're thinking about and then what people um, in the research department um, are thinking about. Right, right. No, thanks very much. And, you know, Abdul, I see a question here from Abdul. Um, he, um, he raised this very same issue. You know, he's asking about practical ways to foster better collaboration between the research side 
and the operational side. Um, uh, you seem to have sort of answered that already, <clears throat> but Leah, anything from your side, you're on the ground, what, what do you need from the researchers, okay. from the economists? Um, thank, thank you, uh, Karen, and thanks uh, for this question. Uh, so for us, um, there, uh, I'll pick up first on, on the collaboration. Uh, there are, as uh, Albert, did, uh, Albert did say, um, upstream involvement is actually very important. And this is why um, for us in the Pacific, we invite uh, our economist colleagues um, to actually, not our economist colleagues and also sector colleagues uh, to join us uh, as we plan uh, for our programs. So for us, uh, for example, in the Pacific, we have something called a country team leaders workshop. And here uh, we try to invite uh, uh, colleagues across uh, to really help inform the discussion as we think about uh, the future programs. Next, uh, during uh, what we, the development of what we call the country partnerships uh, strategies uh, for each country, um, we do collaborate very closely uh, with our uh, colleagues uh, across the bank. Uh, including our economist colleagues. Um, it is very important uh, that the country partnership strategies that we prepare are informed by very good economic and sector analysis. Uh, this is the only way that we can uh, uh, fully see and identify uh, what the gaps, what the challenges are, and how to, prior and how to prioritize um, given uh, the issues on hand. Um, so, uh, so for us, uh, that continued collaboration uh, at uh, the pro at what we call the contract uh, at the country programming uh, level, and also uh, at the project design level, I must say I, I really appreciate uh, the inputs, the contributions our colleagues uh, uh, in uh, the economics department have uh, contributed. Um, I also, um, uh, by, by the way, I would like to ask. Uh, no, no, note something where there really has, was very good collaboration. Uh, and this is uh, the preparation of our Cook Islands uh, recovery uh, uh, policy-based lending. I must say that work would not have uh, proceeded without the excellent participation of our, econ econ our co economist colleagues uh, from the economics department. Really, uh, that was a, a great collaboration. It sounds like we're, I'm, I'm really happy to hear those positive examples of collaboration. I probably, it doesn't mean we're doing a perfect job <laughs> everywhere, uh, but um, I also think, you know, um, Abdul's question also raised this issue also of the incentives on the, on the operation side. And, you know, as economists, we always think about incentives being really <laughs> key in terms of uh, giving, uh, promoting, um, uh, behavior and activity in, in, a, in a desired direction. And I think, um, so uh, collaborators like Leah are terrific. They value what the research economists can contribute. I think for others, one thing we would like to do more of, and this is one of the other questions is uh, really high quality impact evaluation work. And here our research department has an advantage from kind of the academic world in that we have uh, such a close connection to operations that there are many opportunities for us to know about things that are actually happening and to be able to uh, evaluate real projects and be involved through that process. Um, I think it may work better if, uh, you know, people all have an incentive to do high quality evaluation at all levels of operations and research so that they're seeking out these opportunities to show they've done a very rigorous evaluation. Um, and so we are very happy uh, to support those, uh, those types of uh, initiatives. Thanks. Thanks very much for that. Yeah, very important um, point to just to add there. Um, you mentioned, you know, collaboration internally. I'd like to um, turn to Tetsushi, actually, because there is a pretty popular question here, uh, Tetsushi, from Iva, asking about how you see the ADBI research priorities evolving in coming years, particularly in terms of collaboration with other think tanks and potentially other research uh, institutions in the region. Okay. Thank you, Karen. And thank you, Iva, Iva uh, for a good question. And I'm very... I'm a little bit surprised that uh, the question is so popular. So, <laughs> so thank you very much for your interest in the ADBI's activities. Yeah, so uh, uh, roughly speaking, uh, 
yeah, maybe this answer is too abrupt, but uh, we don't have a kind of predetermined priority. We are you know, trying to be more demand driven. And then the previously, as I understand, ADBI has uh, worked a lot on the you know, economic integration, international finance, or FinTech, or, or population aging, and the upgrading SMEs. But uh, you know, because of COVID-19, uh, yeah, which had a huge impact, but the impact varied widely, uh, widely from sector to sector. And uh, also maybe subsector within the sector to subsector. And also the responses, uh, such as the introduction of online classes to schools had uh, very different uh, impacts on the rich families and the uh, you know, poor families. So people want to have, uh, you know, or expect knowledge institutions to provide granular uh, information, data. So that's why ADBI is now uh, conducting uh, you know, household surveys and uh, MSME uh, surveys, and uh, also even the uh, uh, randomized controlled uh, trials about the education uh, kind of thing. So we are now uh, uh, working on the rural development and the transformation, uh, education, climate change risks, energy transition, and those things in addition to fintech, financial inclusion, and population aging. And uh, so we are gathering uh, data uh, by ourselves, but uh, it's impossible for us to work alone. So that's why we are uh, you know, strengthening the collaboration with local uh, think tanks. Uh, whenever uh, we work, uh, you know, try to get that, such uh, granular information, uh, we work with local uh, think tanks. Uh, in addition, uh, we are working with uh, local think tanks in relation to T20, which is uh, engagement group under G20. And uh, to be uh, more and more active at the uh, T20 arena, uh, we are working with uh, local think tanks, especially the, this year, the T20 or G20 presidency is in, in Indonesia. So we are working closely with Indonesian think tanks. And then next year, uh, the T20 presidency will go to India. So we are working closely with India think tanks. Okay, so I stop here. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. There are a lot of questions coming in, I see, about talking about collaboration, uh, more time needing to be spent on uh, understanding, you know, the, the, the real issues on the ground, um, perhaps uh, the operational staff needing more time to set aside to look at research issues and so forth. Um, but I do see that we, you know, we don't have very much time left. So I would like to come to some of the, the more specific focused questions. Um, that we have about uh, about research, um, particularly this first one from from Gambia. Um, he says he'd like to know a little bit more about ADB's drive to focus on evidence based research, given this lack of data, which I think uh, you know has been mentioned before for a lot of the SDGs that we have no data for some of these countries. How do we go about that, Albert? Can I go to you first? Well, of course, this is a challenge if there's a lack of data, and you know we have a data unit that is working very closely with member government statistical offices to improve the quality of data and to try to expand our list of uh, key economic indicators. As you know, we publish reg regularly uh, key indicators for countries throughout the region. Um, and so from a macro standpoint to understand uh, what are the trends or what is happening in different countries and comparing them with each other, then we try to support uh, those efforts through that. There's also, of course, another aspect of evidence-based research, which is also kind of evaluating uh, the impact of specific uh, projects or policies. And that um, is also an area where we are putting a very high priority. Uh, we have a, uh, an initiative to support collaborative impact evaluation studies proposed by um, regional uh, departments, missions, um, and uh, in fact, we should be issuing a call for proposals uh, 
relatively soon for another round of that. We do this uh, at least once a year, a call for proposals. And we're happy to talk with um, uh, people about uh, possible ideas uh, for designing such evaluations to make them more evidence-based, especially I think if, um, if, if departments are trying to uh, pilot new approaches or innovative approaches, uh, doing a very rigorous evaluation, of course, can uh, be very impactful in convincing government officials to expand or commit more resources to those uh, types of interventions. And there's a lot of examples in, uh, in development about uh, rigorous evaluations really changing the way people think about different types of interventions, you know, dating back to the Progressa conditional cash transfer interventions, which was rigorously, rigorously assessed using randomized control trials and became a huge, hugely popular model throughout the developing world. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. One, one more of these more general questions to Tetsuji, uh, to you, if I may, before we get into some of the very specific subject focus. This question from um, Editha, she asks, um, to what extent um, do you see uh, the value of cross-country or region-wide uh, research versus, uh, versus uh, country-specific um, research? And I might, Leah, ask you to jump in mm -hmm. as well. Um, uh -huh. after Ted Sushi, to, just to respond to that. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, of course, uh, both types of research are uh, okay. very important, but uh, you know, cross-country empirical research will provide kind of uh, you know, lessons from other countries. So the you know, better solution may exist, or the, you know, the reason why the, uh, my country's uh, you know, solution or government solution or attempt is not so successful. The, the hint will may come from the you know regional uh, studies. So I think that uh, this is very important. And uh, also uh, recently, I have uh, trying to conduct uh, kind of personal interviews with country directors uh, because of uh, you know uh, demand-driven approach. So then I, I uh, while talking with those country directors, uh, so far uh, seven uh, eight. Eight, eight, eight directors. And then I learned a lot. And then I found that all oh, the problems are similar. <laughs> so lots of similarity. Yeah, although, of course, you know, in detail, uh, uh, problems and the situations are different uh, from country to country, but uh, there must be a lot of uh, opportunity to learn from other countries' experience. Thank you very much. Thanks. No, absolutely. <laughs> um, Leah, you're looking after, I think, 14 countries now, right? 14 very different countries. Am I correct? 14? Yes. Um, do you see um, value to the countries that you're looking after from this cross-regional research, or do you really need very, very focused country-based research? Uh, thank you, Karen. Uh, thank you, Dita, for the question. I must say, I, I echo what uh, uh, Sanobisan uh, has uh, said. Um, there's actually a, a lot of value uh, in cross-country empirical research. Uh, sometimes uh, we do not see patterns in a particular country, but if we actually look at uh, results from different countries and do a comparative study, we see some patterns and we learn from those patterns. So we can apply why something works. We might say that, oh, this uh, particular uh, subsidy policy uh, did not uh, work here. And then we might say, oh, it's country specific. But if we see something similar in other countries, then we get to understand better uh, why it would work or why it may not work. Now, um, and then of course, uh, later on, this will have to be complemented by a deep dive by a country specific study. So it, they're complementary. In fact, we need both. Thank you. Always, always. Okay, let's get to some specifics here now. I'm seeing one from Salil asking about the efficacy of geospatial data. Uh, Albert. Geospatial data, I think, is becoming an increasingly important resource for uh, economic research. Um, it's kind of part of a broader kind of big data uh, movement um, and can be really valuable. Number one, it can give you um, indicators of economic activity, depending the, the nature of the data, if it's satellite imagery of night lights or 
uh, it can give you information about obviously uh, pollution and emissions uh, to try to understand what's happening, not just at the country level or even the regional level, but at a very fine level of disaggregation. And if you can match that kind of data to, for instance, the location of projects or uh, the scope of specific policies or industrial zones, you can learn quite a lot more about not just the overall impacts, but the nature of those impacts, the geographic scope of those impacts, the spillovers of something that's happening in one area for, uh, for neighboring areas, et cetera. So it, it's, a, it's a hugely important uh, resource. And I think um, we'll be at, uh, I mean, new data in general is with the new technologies producing it is, is gonna be something that we need to just keep track of, not just to be doing the newest thing, but because you know, there's really new insight uh, that can be learned applying some of these powerful uh, data sources. Yeah, absolutely. And another question from Celil that I might uh, direct to uh, Leah about uh, in the context of Tonga, as, as you mentioned uh, earlier in the session, um, could we be using uh, geospatial data uh, more effectively to perhaps uh, either predict or respond to these some extreme events that, that Tonga has just seen and has seen very often? Uh, thank you for that, uh, for this question. In fact, uh, the data that we've gathered in our multi-hazard uh, risk, disaster risk assessment uh, for Tonga, for, um, for the island of Tungatapu, is very helpful. Uh, in fact, it is informing right now our uh, preliminary assessments on uh, potential damages. And as I mentioned, this is something that we've also shared with a volcano science expert. And, as, and that person is estimating uh, at this point uh, the, the impact of ash fall uh, on various assets and on, on various infrastructure uh, in the island uh, itself. Um, and he, uh, when we actually prepared this study, um, satellite imagery uh, across what we could gather not just uh, from the recent years, but actually uh, earlier uh, satellite uh, information that we could get was very useful. So uh, changes over time, if we have that information, it's going to be uh, very uh, helpful to all of our work. And this will be informing, in fact, um, beyond uh, the recovery from, this, uh, from the volcan volcanic eruption, um, this will inform also um, the location and design of infrastructure uh, in the future and other interventions that we would have, let's say, for water and sanitation. Um, um, now, looking forward and expanding this, I think there's definitely room uh, for expanding this kind of work. And this is what we're looking at in the Pacific, uh, in the Pacific region. And, uh, and this multi-hazard risk, uh, disaster risk assessment is also now being looked at by colleagues uh, in other regional departments. So there's uh, definitely uh, this geospatial data uh, complements uh, the other research data that we are uh, gathering on the ground. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. It can never work uh, independently, can it? Um, very quick question to Tetsushi, maybe Albert too. There's a question here from Edmund asking about whether we have any studies or work on uh, the economic effects of uh, coastal reclamation. Oh, that's uh, kind of related to the climate uh, change risk. Uh, yeah, there is a nice study by my colleague, uh, John Ban, uh, about uh, you know, climate change risk and the sovereign risk. So the sovereign debt, the interest rate is higher if the country is exposed to you know, more climate risk, uh, risks. <laughs> and then if the interest rate, rate is higher and then the, the government is reluctant to you know, invest sufficiently in the, you know, uh, the infrastructure against uh, that risk, then the interest rate will go up further and then more difficult to borrow. So uh, that's why the you know, uh, international community have to help the, the, those uh, you know, countries or economies. So that kind of study exists. And then maybe he we, and his colleagues will be uh, working on that further. Thank you very much. Thanks, Albert. Uh, I'm not specifically aware of 
specific research in ERSD on this topic, but I could be not just not aware of it. Uh, uh, but it's a really important issue. You know, I think Asia has a much higher percentage of its population living on coast than any other region of the world. And um, I've seen other research very interesting about how the nature of kind of coastal development often doesn't adequately factor in the risks that the incentives of city government officials or local planning officials about where to develop often because living on the coast is often quite popular. So they often develop there and that the, the systems don't really adequately (laughs) factor in, you know, that this is creating aggregate risk for having large populations right on the coast. So I think it's an interesting area for, for research. Great, thanks. And could I just stay with you and just ask you one more question? Uh, we have something, a question from Emily about um, micro and small and medium-sized enterprises. How, how can they get hold of uh, research work and make it work for them? Any thoughts on that? Because I think you've done some work in this area, if I'm not mistaken. Right, well, our department has an initiative uh, to create really for the first time uh, comparable uh, indicators of uh, measurements of the development of small and medium scale enterprises in countries throughout Asia. So, uh, you know, there's a group that's been doing really painstaking work, uh, working with statistical agencies to try to understand the data indicators and try to make them um, as uh, high quality and comparable as possible, ad- admittedly with some limitations. So uh, we've been issuing a set of reports on SME developments in the region, and I think we have some uh, more ongoing activity in in that area. So that's something to look out for just as a knowledge product that provides uh, a picture of what's happening, but then also um, includes some analysis of different issues. So those types of knowledge products would, I think, be of interest uh, to uh, small and medium scale enterprises. Uh, wherever they might be, they'll probably be more interested in what's happening in their own uh, locality. But of course, also with COVID, we know that um, uh, SMEs have, you know, uh, were particularly hurt by lockdowns. And so there's been a lot of policy interest in understanding ways to support uh, such enterprises. And uh, there's certainly been a lot of research uh, on this topic, uh, both uh, within the research department and outside in the broader uh, academic community. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I'm very sorry to see that we're coming right up to the bottom of the hour. So um, we've got a lot of questions in. We didn't get to nearly as many of them as we wanted to. But um, Albert, just before we uh, we shut down for the day, get back to our, our day jobs, as it were, um, any, any last parting uh, words of wisdom? Well, I would just emphasize that, you know, we're in a world uh, that is changing so rapidly. Um, and there are the challenges with the pandemic, but also I think the increasing urgency of the challenges of climate change and other challenges um, with uh, kind of the future direction of global economic integration kind of in question. And so uh, research is, uh, you know, could never have been more important time for research to provide uh, knowledge and insight that can help inform kind of a sensible thinking about how to address of uh, these challenges that we're facing. It's of course very challenging because research, high quality research of course takes time and preparation. Um, uh, so we need to be forward looking. We need to be thinking uh, where, as I said before, in prioritizing what we do, um, thinking about what is going to be the best use of our research energy and time and resources, uh, kind of projecting forward at a moving target of, of, of what the challenges are Uh, in the future. And uh, I actually, you know, the theme of this session, I really believe in that it it will take collaboration, you know, with ADBI, with people outside the bank, but especially within ADB, between the research department and the operation side. And I'm I'm sure both sides have complained about uh, how we do things or how it could be better or why isn't it like this and that. Uh, So at least, you know, sitting here as chief economist, I can just commit that uh, I'm at least fully engaged in trying to improve and maximize our ability to coordinate and produce uh, quality knowledge um, products that can inform uh, operations and broader policy reform. Thank you. Thank you. You heard it here first. It's a brave new world. (laughs) (laughs) 
We're at the end of our session today. I want to thank you all for your participation, for your insightful questions. Apologies again that we didn't get to as many of them as we would have liked to. Thank you to our discussants, of course, to uh, Albert Park, our new chief economist here at the Asian Development Bank, Tetsushi Sonobe, Dean of the Asian Development Bank Institute. Thank you very much. And uh, Leah Gutierrez, Director General of the Pacific uh, Department here at the Asian Development Bank for those insights from what people really need on the ground. So just to let you know, the recording will be posted in coming days on adb.org and on YouTube. And I would also, while I'm here, like to uh, invite you to join us later in the day, 9.30 p.m. Uh, Manila, Singapore time, uh, to join our next um, Asian Impact webinar, which will feature distinguished speaker uh, Darren um, Asemoglu. In his lecture, uh, Darren uh, will be talking about um, uh, a number of issues, but particularly automation and its potential economic, political, and social uh, costs for developing Asia. Thank you for joining us today. Have a great rest of the day.